welcome to Tech Ops. My name is Eric. I'm also known as King Neptune uh, on social media, so Twitter, uh, Reddit, Discord, you name it. I'm normally joined by Greg. He's not here today. He had to take care of some personal business because he's getting ready to live the good life, taking care of his YouTube channel. But I do have a guest. I have Commander Ryan Ramsey. But first, I wanted to go into our sponsor. This episode of Tech Ops is brought to you by the Commando Store. So check out this online military surplus store to find clothing, footwear, gear, accessories, equipment, patches, stickers, and even snacks. Their stock from around the world is updated every few weeks. Check them out at Commando Store. That's Commando with a K, and the link is below in the description. So use our code TACOPS, T-A-C-O-P-S, all one word, for 5% off your first purchase. They have some really cool stuff there. If you're, if you're into you know Army-Navy surplus stores, but you don't really want to have to filter through the old crap, it's a really good place to go to. And uh, we, we have, a, we have a, uh, a deal with them to get you a good percentage off, so, uh, so go check them out. So now I have uh, Commander Ryan Ramsey. Uh, also, he was a captain, uh, so I want to clarify that a little bit. We have some followers that are kind of new to the military. So in the in the Navy, we have a rank of commander and captain, but you can be, or generally you are a commander by rank, but you're given the title captain or skipper. So it could be a bit confusing because there is also the rank, which is captain, which is usually higher or is higher. But so we have a uh, commander, Ryan Ramsey. He was the captain of the HMS Turbulent served. How many, how many years did you serve, sir? Oh, well, so I did uh, 26 years in the Navy and uh, three years, four months in command of HMS Turbulent. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the other submarines you served on? Yeah, sure. So I uh, joined the submarine service in 1991. Fortunate enough to have served on two Oberon class. Then I did a exchange with the Royal Netherlands Navy, first submarine exchange with the Royal Netherlands Navy. And I served on two of the Dutch Warriors class, which was good fun. Then I served on HMS Spartan as navigator, uh, HMS Talent as the operations officer. Then I did my Perisher course, a submarine command course. Then I was EXO of HMS Torbay. Um, then I went to uh, Comsub Debron 12 in the US. So I served with the US Navy for two years before coming back to do a master's degree and then going off to command HMS Turbulent. And then the final piece after that was I was teacher. So I managed to teach the Perisher course or the submarine command course for the UK. And then I, I retired gracefully. <laughs> Yeah, we we heard the story about the uh, the 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 recent story about the captain taking his uh, car home <laughs> on the weekends. He did he didn't get that uh, that good retirement, I guess, huh? No, no. Well, I'm sure I'm sure the navy will deal with whatever the um, whatever the incident is, and you know that's a, that's a lesson about leadership by by example in itself. However small it is, um, your crew are looking. You you live by the same standards that they do, so um, so action has to be taken accordingly. Yeah, seriously, it's uh, you know the the captains are, are very scrutinized. They look at every everything you do. You know, I mean, they're in your life, so you can't just go out. You know, because we just fired a, a a captain who was walking around with prostitutes. You know, one of the one of the the lower ranking guys saw him out in town with like I guess he had like ten prostitutes or something like that. And he was walking around town with them and I said, "Hey, look, man," he told the command what what he saw, and they're like, "Hey, you can't uh." can't be walking around with prostitutes you're a captain <laughs> you know you, you have to hold you to a standard you know one of the things they taught me when i was in was you're not eric marino you're the navy so when you go out and do something you are us so you can't just go out there and act full yeah absolutely and i think when when you're um when you're leading on a submarine or you're in that position of command you, you have to be absolute there can be no no faults. You must be just pure, effectively, during that. You're expected to hold other people to account, so you have to hold yourself to account first. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it, they, from what I've seen, just a pattern online and, uh, and, and just in general, the captains of submarines seem to have a very, very high level of leadership standards. Uh, because, you, you, I mean, I've, I probably know five submarine captains right now that have books on leadership. And... They're they're one of the best that I've ever had. My you know the the greatest leader that I had was our first captain when I went on the ISEX in two thousand four. Our captain, who's now the chief of naval uh, personnel, I mean he's great. I mean, and I look at him and I think about the leadership and the things he did for us almost on a daily basis. And then we rolled into a captain who was he, he turned our boat into hell. You know, it was hell, and he ended up getting fired for. Uh, having our ELTs f uh, forge his signatures and stuff because they didn't want to deal with them. It was crazy. It was it was such a bad situation. It was and it, it was it all pivoted 
on one person switching out to another person. And, and that and that role is huge, especially when you have when you're dealing with stuff like reactors and weapons and you're you're putting it all in a tube underwater. Uh, it gets pretty hectic. Yeah, I think the, um, the responsibility of people's lives for me was um, was was huge. And not a day went by that I thought I was asked to take risk on a daily basis to do high end missions. But my biggest responsibility was to make sure we did all of that, but get the crew back safely. And, um, and actually, you need to have some fun as well while you're doing it. So if it's all pain, then, 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 then that's not a good place to be. But you, you're right, that steel tube reflects everything about individual personality and the position of being a captain it can be incredibly powerful. And you either use it to serve your crew or you use it to serve yourself. And I was very much about serving my crew and making it as best an experience as we could all have. Yeah, it's such, it seemed like it was such a hard balance to watch them them try to be like good people and be a good captain, but at the same time, be a good leader and powerful and, you know, be, you know, not necessarily emotional, but show these guys like, Hey, we have lives here. You know, you can't just, you know, just willy nilly fuck around. Like you have to follow procedure. You have to do this. I'm not teaching you this to just talk about it. I'm teaching you this because you have to do it. And, but at the same time, you wanted to see them be nice and be, you know, kind of, uh, forgiving and if you didn't have that balance you know it was really it was really difficult to watch them try to lead yeah exactly it's, it's a tough gig but you know it's also the most rewarding thing you can ever do I, I, from my from my personal perspective since i've been in the civilian world and led in business in a variety of businesses whilst that's been really challenging and really exciting still the zenith of of my uh, professional life and, and in some ways my personal life was my three years in command of hms turbulence so yeah, definitely. I wanted to ask you a, a little bit about that. Just a little bit of background of Turbulent. The big thing that I think that she did was back in 2003, she actually shot off 30 Tomahawks uh, in Iraq. Uh, I'm not sure about the number. This is kind of what I read online, but uh, 30 Tomahawks, is a, that's a good number to, to launch at once. And uh, she came back uh, carrying the Jolly Roger. Um, and then you took, you took command in what year was it? So I took command in 2008. Okay, in 2008. So you were part of the intervention in Libya, correct? Yeah, that's correct, in 2011. So, so in the meanwhile, I mean, Tur- Turbulent is an amazing, or was an amazing submarine. And um, from, from the very beginning until she decommissioned, um, you, you won't find anybody in, in all of those crews who doesn't say that it's, it's one of the best submarines they ever served on. Uh, and that speaks volumes about the platform, but it speaks volumes about the the, the teams as well so it's a huge success uh, in a variety of theaters and like you, you mentioned Iraq but also um, in the Atlantic as well and Indian Ocean and other places and 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 in the Far East too so so she's been all over the place during her lifetime yeah sure okay yeah definitely can well so can you tell us a little bit about uh, Libya and what what that involves you know we, they don't really talk a whole lot about it here so you know anything involving the UK Royal Navy we don't get a whole lot of news especially in the US yeah, sure. So, so um, it was part of a. Uh, obviously, the 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 prime objective was uh, the removal of um, uh, Colonel Gaddafi uh, and to bring round a democratic vote and well, democracy within the country. So that that's the that's what the politicians wanted, and I think that was from both both the UK and the US, but also uh, within Europe as well. So two stages to the mission. The first one was um, it was largely UK and US led, and that was when they did the first wave of. Tomahawks into uh, Libya, so I think it was over a hundred birds uh, flown into um, into Libya on the first couple of days to remove all of the air defence systems, um, and then and that that was fired by our sister submarine HMS Triumph, um, and we were on our way down to replace her. Whilst our main strategic aim was actually to go a deployment east of Suez. So uh, off Libya for us was all about intelligence gathering and also to make sure that um, the sanctions uh, that were supposed to be upheld weren't broken. Um, and that was usually movement of arms or smuggling of people. So it was a really complicated theatre, not particularly because all of NATO was there as well. So suddenly you've got 16, 17 countries all trying to operate in the same area. And, and I think on the TV, we, we took a TV crew with us for, for the duration of it. Uh, and one of the, the, the commentary was that we, we experienced gridlock, basically. It's just so many units there. So it's um, so busy, really, really busy. 
Yeah, it's interesting to see like so many different states, countries, however you want to say it, work together in such a close knit area. It's 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 really interesting. And 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 that was one of the things that you said you wanted to talk about was that how well we work together just country to country, especially when it comes to the US and the UK, like how how well put together we are. Yeah, I think it's, it's it, it constantly amazes me how close, and, and I talk particularly, you, you hear about the special relationship between the UK and the US, but I think there's two areas where it's really, really close. The first one is submarine service, and the second one is special forces. And um, the submarine service, for, for, for the duration of my submarine career, we've always worked hand in hand with the Americans. And like I said, my two years of being privileged to serve with Comsub Deborah on 12, and, and that exchange program had been going for a long, long time. Um, was incredible. You know, it was all about open exchange of uh, tactics, open exchange of development, and, and making sure that was shared between both the UK and the US partners. And actually, the patrol cycles, everything else like that, uh, you could intersperse. So actually, whatever the Americans were doing, uh, we could we could stand in if we needed to. And equally, it was the other way around too. So it was a very very strong relationship, which I know continues to this day. And finally, finally probably testament for that in my in my last job when I was teaching. Um, the submarine command course. I was lucky enough to have uh, one of my students on my first course was a U.S. officer. So um, and he did he did really really well. And that was also a testament to the cross fertilization of information and tactics between our two nations. Was he the was he the first American to go through the course? Because I have never heard of that before. Yeah, no. So he wasn't the first. So the first went through. Um, I'm going to say in 2003. And I, might, I might have that that day wrong, but I'm pretty certain it's 2003. And then there's been a steady steady flow of usually one every couple of years um, and I know in the last couple of years it's been one every year or one every course so yeah so the US go over there and, and for, for us so I, I had the privilege of attending some of the SCC the submarine command course in the US do their weapon firings and stuff like that when I was with Compsat Deborah on 12 but equally we've sent people from um, from the Royal Navy to go and do the SCC the submarine command course out there. So they kind of intermingle like how how different are they? Is is there a big difference between the UK and the American one? So, um, so, so no, they're both about leadership. So, so both courses are definitely about leadership, how you take risk, and how you deal with tactics and situations. So, so that that's common between the two. The premise for how the Brits run their course is different to the way that the Americans do theirs. Um, but but for me, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time reflecting about that. And, and I, I reached the conclusion that whilst there were differences in the way things were done, there were similarities too. But the outcome was the same, which is people that are capable of leading uh, effectively on submarines. So, yeah, different approaches, but the outcome's the same. Yeah, definitely. They actually teach you guys on different boats, right? So if you, so if you go to the American course, you go on American boats. You go to the UK, you go through the UK course. When you, when you go, do you have to go through both? Yeah, so a guy who uh, you wouldn't send somebody over to do the U.S. submarine com command course and then bring them back to drive a British submarine, and equally the Americans wouldn't do the same there. So right, right. So they they need their own checks and controls to make sure that they're they're balanced for the specifics of uh, driving either a U.S. or a U.K. platform. So is this like an extra curricular, I guess you could say, or is this something that they would say, hey, look, you're going to be commanding a boat that's going to be heavily working with the UK. We want to send you through their course. Is that is that kind of how they're how they're picked for it? No, no. So, so they're picked because generally you'd have done the command course first and then you go off to go and do the do the opposite command course. So it's extracurricular, really. But you get to learn a whole load of different tactics, different ways of doing things. And the idea is, is that you bring that back to your uh, own Navy, and therefore you enable best practice to, to increase within that particular force. So what do you think some of the advantages are of the American course? And, and what do you think some of the advantages are of the UK course that we really use together to, to help build our teams? Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of real advantages on the American course is the amount of weapon firings you get to do. So when they go down to all tech and, and you, you, you will fire a lot of weapons and, and that that is fantastic. Now, the UK fire weapons, but there's nowhere near as many as they do there. Um, so that, that's one part. The, the, the other part is the complexity of operating down there is is different. So you've got an instrumented range, you've got real tracking, you've got loads of units, which is fantastic. And, and, it, and it works really, really well. So the advantages on the, the RN one is... It's all done around Scotland generally, which means you've got to do really close inshore operations. 
it's, it's exceptionally testing just on a navigational navigational side alone and then if you add in everything else that's going on that makes it complex so so in their own ways they they've got some they, they've got their own advantages but like i say i think the the outcome is the same it's the leadership it's of course about leadership uh, risk taking decision making and tactics yeah definitely a lot of people don't know that our our weapon systems uh, intermingle really really well you know we have the same torpedo tubes for example we have the same mark 48 torpedo tubes but you know you look at you look at the torpedo room uh, on an astute and then you look at the torpedo room on a virginia if you're just looking at the front i mean they look almost exactly the same yeah it's, it, there are big similarities um, so one of the other things I wanted to talk about, you, you know, you were talking about how you guys worked in Libya and on your way out, you guys had a little trouble uh, with your air conditioning. I was curious if you could talk to me about that because I was, I was a mechanic and uh, we, we had to take care of all this uh, atmosphere control equipment. And, uh, you know, like I talked about, uh, or we're going to talk about uh, oxygen candles, but uh, all this atmosphere control equipment is really, really important, especially now because of all of the computer systems and uh, everything that's required to, to run all this equipment, it starts to get really hot in there. You know, back in the day, it used to be, you know, they were running diesels and it would get really hot and they could turn everything off around the batteries and they kind of cool off and dive. But nowadays we have to run so much sonar and fire control equipment and all this stuff to navigate. It gets real hot, real quick. You know, the radio room, all this stuff has to be really cold so it's interesting to hear uh about a nuke boat that lost air conditioning so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that yeah sure so so it's a little bit later than um libya so we'd, we'd finished libya then we, were, we went through the um suez canal so the first british military unit through the suez canal after the arab uh, uprising um, and and that was quite tense and then through the Red Sea into the Gulf of Oman and then into Fajara and while we we're alongside we we're alongside of Fajara to do some maintenance uh, before setting out on a patrol in the Indian Ocean and um, uh, on the day of uh, 25th of May it was so on the day that we we left water temperature was really quite high 37 degrees Celsius um, we slipped from our escort vessel, RFA Diligence, and within um, a couple of hours of uh, leaving the port, um, the air conditioning plants failed uh, catastrophically. Um, and the, the, it, I, it's amazing how quickly uh, things deteriorated, but in, in essence, and, and in a very short time scale to tell this story, but um, in essence, the, the temperature rose in the forward part of the submarine uh, up to about 40 degrees Celsius and 100% humidity. And, and in the um, engine room um, and maneuvering room up to 60 degrees Celsius and 100% humidity. So and then started having a series of uh, series of casualties, obviously from from that. But equally, um, because nobody had seen this, it was a completely wicked problem. Trying to fix it was was really really difficult. So when you went, I, I went. I was on the bridge when it when it first happened. And when I went down into the submarine, it was very dark because people were trying to switch off lights, computers, anything else. Sonar systems was being shut down in order to minimise the heat. Whilst they tried to sort out what the problem was and nobody knew what it was because they keep on trying to restart the air conditioning plants and, and that continues to fail. First casualty happened to be one of my petty officers who was suffering from heat exhaustion. He was going to be the one of 27 casualties during that, um, what worked out to be three hours and 40 minutes. So, um, so then you went back into the engine room, uh, into manoeuvring in the engine room. Um, they're still trying to sort the problem out. They're worried about the because the reactor fails safe, so they're worried about the reactor shutting down and uh, all of these things conspiring to uh, to go against us, and the, and the heat obviously um, is a big problem. The next things uh, that happen in the casualty front is um, I lose some of my key players, so my engineer um, uh, is is one of the uh, well, he's he's the third casualty. Uh, then I've lost two more of my engineering officers too. Um, suddenly I'm down to one engineering officer. That's it in total. Um, and um, you, you you happen to reduce cycle times in the engine room because it's so hot there. And then we're, we're trying to work out um, how to, to solve the problem. And of course, everybody's under stress. Main players are, are sort of exhausted by what's going on. Um, and eventually, I, I, I've got decisions to make. So the first first option is to try and sail back to Fajara, which was which is impossible. In essence, we stayed another three and a bit hours to try and get back. Uh, one, we might not have made it. Uh, and two, people 
may have lost their lives during that period of time. So the second option was to stay where we are and hope for rescue. Um, but actually, there's nobody able to support us um, nearest frigates 24 hours away. And we're outside of shipping lanes because we're we're off to heading off to where we were supposed to dive anyway. And then um, and then we reached the decision point. Actually, the best thing you could do is to dive the submarine. Um, in all the tertiary modes because now primary modes are failing as well um, and if we can get underwater and get the submarine cool then actually we should be able to start fixing the problem so deal with that and then try and fix the problem so that's what we decided to do and we dived the submarine got it down to 200 250 meters underwater where it was cooler uh, cycled all the water in all the tanks uh, including the ballast tanks as well um, and gradually the temperature started reducing, which gave them time to go and find the problems, um, fix the problems, which happened to be the combined coolers were blocked. And then once they unblocked the combined coolers, uh, then they were able to get the air conditioning plants back up and running um, and get going again. So, um, so yeah, it was a hell of a, <laughs> hell of a morning, really. Um, tested tested people to their limits um, and it also t- i'll tell you that all through it th- there were some real heroes there and the petty officer medic was just an incredible guy uh, one paramedic on board our submarines and then you got some medics as well and he he was just an awesome individual he went around um every single casualty that came up he was dealing with all the time and kept going with it the most junior guy on the submarine you know t- throughout all of that when we're focused on this this is the guy that turns around and says sir you know the, the electrolyzers are shut down and we're we're not running the co2 absorption unit so you suddenly think actually do you know what it's not only really the heat that brings us down it's actually going to be carbon dioxide so he goes up and flashes up the uh, emergency carbon dioxide absorption unit such that we start absorbing that so everybody played their parts and, and there's no way that it could rely on one person alone it was everybody as a team team that was doing it and and the final bit i'll say is that amazingly for our <clears throat> throughout all of it humor um stood stood the test so i remember going into the um galley and the chef is still cooking <laughs> even though it's it's chaos and, and i looked at him and i said chef daniels are you all right and he goes, and it was a sunday and he goes well the meat's all right but the potatoes have had it <laughs> and i just looked at him and said okay just you can ha- have some water and just keep hydrated and then and then off we went to do it so so yeah it tested everybody to to their limits and um and and, and it, it took a long time to, to be quite frank it took a long time for people to recover afterwards luckily yeah we talk about mental health now and it's really open and everything else like that and that's fantastic but Back in 2011, it was still an emerging thing, I think. So luckily, I had a trauma management team on board. So we've got some guys trained up in dealing with uh, trauma management. And they were great for, for directly after the event. And I, I'm sure without them, we'd have, uh, more of us would have suffered longer term issues with, with that whole day. Yeah, I think that's that's a huge tool that's really underutilized is just mental health trauma too. Somebody, just somebody you can talk to and be like, "Yeah, I almost died today." You know, <laughs> like this is yeah. like I, I still want to do this. This job's amazing, but yeah, I almost died today. So like, it'd be nice to just talk to somebody. It's nice if you have a spouse, but you know, there's a lot of young guys that you know they're not going to call their mom, you know, and tell her what happened. They need somebody else to talk to, and it's really important that we get something like that. It's I, I, it's it's awesome that you that you bring that up. Yeah, it's good. So what did you guys end up finding out that blocked it? Was it like dirt or so, like what got in there? Interestingly, um, the the consort vessel, that uh, our support vessel, sailed the next day and only got as far as outside the harbour and then suffered the same, not the same thing, but her engine shut down. So they came back into harbour and then sent divers down and they found, there weren't barnacles, but these crustaceans that gathered around all the inlets and in some it had not been seen in Fajara before, but from somewhere all these crustaceans had turned up and attached themselves to both us and diligence. So so I think the um the view was somewhere along the way one of the two of us had picked something up and in the heat of that water these things had, had increased in size and, and got themselves in all of our inlets. So so um so yeah that was a cause. So uh, uh, what was that a half a billion pound submarine was nearly stopped by some crustaceans. 
you never know where the enemy is. Yeah, it's really interesting. On the outside of the boats, you start growing all kinds of stuff. You know, we, we always talk about uh, the grass skirt that, that grows on the outside of that thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we got it. We got a real, especially when we were in San Diego, we went over to the Pacific. I mean, we had moss that grew off that thing probably eight inches. I mean, it was super long and it would, it was, it was so thick that it would take, it take four or five knots off your top speed, you know, like just the stuff that grows on the outside or inside of your boat can, can really damage your systems. Yeah. It's, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. The sea life out there. There's pretty unforgiving. So one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was uh, uh, going on the ISEX. Yeah. I got the privilege of going on uh, the ISEX in 2004 with the, the Hampton. Uh, we went up there with HMS Tireless. Uh, we had uh, it was, uh, pr- a perfect, perfect underway. We had no problems. One of the things that I really enjoyed uh, about that underway is we got to kind of battle them. You know, we will do like war games out there. You know, if you got two subs out there, you just send them out there and they got an extra day or two, let them battle each other and see who's better. You know, and we had a lot of fun with them. <laughs> and uh, I, I argue with the guys because I know some guys that are actually on the tireless on, on Twitter and I argue with them. But I think we won most of the because we it was like 10 of them and we won the most. And uh, we actually our captains bet um, that uh, whoever won. So if we won, we would get uh, beer because you guys will carry uh, beer underway with you guys. And ever since we put in General Order 99 or whatever back in the before the 20s, I think, where we haven't had beer on our boats for a long time. So it's like, hey, so you you trade us some beer. If you guys win, we'll give you our soft serve ice cream. The tireless wasn't carrying ice cream at the time. And so we ended up, we ended up having a good time and uh, we battled or whatever. And the, the Navy was like, absolutely not. You guys cannot have a keg of beer. There's no way. Uh, but instead, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll send you guys back to uh, Plymouth and you guys can port there and, and have a week there and enjoy that. So it was, we had a lot of fun even after we went to the ISEX, but uh, uh, went up there with HMS Tireless. They were a great crew. Oh, cool. We actually surfaced close enough to each other that we got to walk to each other's boat and uh, I ended up. Yeah, I ended up getting a little uh, frostbite in my toe because there's, you know, yeah. when you walk on the ice, it's just ice. So every once in a while, it'll swallow like your whole leg. <laughs> and I was pulling my boot, my my leg out, and I was packing ice into my boot. It was, but it was fun. We had a we had a really good time out there. But um, you had a you actually had a, an interesting ice ax. You know, ours was pretty uneventful. I think every every submarine that goes up there probably has close calls with with icebergs. So you do emergency deeps, and it's you know it's crazy and. But you have a, a particularly interesting story because you were a Royal Submariner that went up there on a U.S. boat. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience up there with ISEX. Yeah, sure. So, so um, uh, ISEX in 2007. Uh, so I, I worked for um, Comsub Devron 12 at the time. And one of my responsibilities as uh, coordinated operations officer was uh, running the uh, tech dev for, for ISEX. So I led the planning and uh, had a great team from from the US Navy and also Atlas helping plan the entire ISEX. Flew up to Prudhoe Bay and then out onto the ice, which is an experience that's impossible to forget. Um, just, just amazing uh, to go out to the ice camp and then waited for USS Alexandria to surface through the ice, which was equally amazing to see a submarine surface through the ice while she stood on the same ice. That is just, just crazy. And then we dived, I, I got on board, we dived and we started off on the series of uh, exercise. But unfortunately, tragically, there was uh, an explosion on board the uh, tireless at the time, it was about four in the morning. And basically they'd had, and, and I'll tell you what we observed and then I can explain what happened and what's well known what happened at the time. So so I remember being in the um, uh, in the control room and then you heard the sonar operators report that they'd heard an explosion, small explosion, and then you could hear Tyler speeding up in speed. So my first uh, reaction out of that is if she's speeding up, they've had an explosion, don't know what that, what that is, but if, they, if they're speeding up and they think they've got a flood, because that's the standard EOP, emergency operating procedure under ICE, um, is to speed up 16 knots so you can contain any ingress uh, or the, the, the weight that comes with the ingress of water until you can find a polynia, which is basically a gap in the ice to surface. And then they were talking on the underwater telephone, but they were talking on the underwater telephone in their emergency breathing system. So so you could hear that. And they went, oh my God, they've got a fire as well, obviously. Um, so she surfaced and then we just stayed with her, obviously depth separated, stayed with her and just waited for instructions effectively. So working on those two bits alone, we all sat down as a group to try and work out what support we could give to her if if the damage was really considerable. So the case of, uh, like you said, 
servicing close by, maybe rafting up um, and then providing safe haven for the team to come over. Whatever they needed, we, we should be able to provide that. And then, and then we stopped with that. And then I remember um, the captain at the time, uh, Mike Bernacki, I'd, I'd gone to, to bed. Yeah, I didn't sleep, obviously, that much. But then he called me up to tell me that um, uh, two of the crew had uh, died and the third was being airlifted to uh, a military hospital. And uh, and that was really, really, really shocking uh, to hear that, that um, two people had lost, lost their lives there. But the um, then... The whole piece of leadership comes into it. So Ian Breckenridge, who's the who was the captain of Tireless at the time, he needed to get the submarine back to the UK. So it was all about making the submariners, checking the submarines safe, motivating your crew again, despite the fact that they've lost two of their shipmates and a third is very seriously uh, injured. And managed to, they dived, I think it was about 24 hours later, uh, did their final checks, one last comms over underwater telephone and then they went back under the under the ice and returned to the UK and we carried on doing just some self stuff noise measuring and stuff like that until we surfaced again and I left and flew back to Groton but yeah on board I mean I I used to do a talk with uh, Ian Breckenridge because obviously I had the loss of the air conditioning plants and multiple casualties and he and I used to go around and talk together about both of our challenges and he was he was just incredible that day how he led um his team and got them back yeah that's that's really interesting so could you could you tell us well what you think f- happened like what happened like what what was the explosion yeah they know they know what happened i mean they did um they did a huge investigation into it so two young sailors um were doing well one was teaching the other how to use the new oxygen candles and they ignited it as you would do standard and then it exploded and the explosion was in the forward escape compartment which is quite a cramped uh, place in one of the side compartments there was a was a another sailor who survived the first um the first explosion and as he stepped out he was the vision you know i can't even imagine what he thought at the time which was two casualties uh, multiple fires everywhere the access uh, plates were buckled so he's trying to deal with that um equally the submarine filled with smoke quite rapidly um and equally the man uh, the manual uh, flood alarm had been set off by the explosion which is why they sped up to 16 knots the smoke went right the way through the forward part of the submarine pretty much filled the forward part of the submarine um, and the firefighting crews got ready and off they went up towards the forward escape in order to try and sort the problem out but the problem is is that they couldn't get any access it took them over 20 minutes to get access because of the buckled floor plates so actually the one person who was dealing with all of it and some of the tough choices he had was putting out the fires and or trying to save life at the same time so he kept going until they could break in and then they extinguished the fires and brought control to the submarine so and, and the root cause of that was that the oxygen candle uh, and i think this is in the report as well but the oxygen candle when it was on shore had been stored incorrectly and therefore when it was ignited on the submarine and using a standard operating procedure it exploded right and so i want to explain a little bit about oxygen candles uh and this story this storm it really hits me close because i was an a-ganger on uh the hampton and i lit oh man i bet you i, I bet you i lit over 200 of those candles the 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 time I served on that boat. And the, the candles in this case were a tad bit different, but the candles we used were in these green canisters. And what you do is there's a, it looks, looks like a nail. And on the tip of the nail, there's a, a like a red phosphorus that they use for matches. And you stick it inside the candle and then you spin it in the candle. And when you do that, it will ignite whatever that chemical is inside there. And it gets super duper hot. It'll like emit oxygen that you can breathe. So if you don't have your oxygen generator up or you, your oxygen banks are low, you can't use them. Or you want, like you said, you wanted to stay quiet. You can you can produce oxygen burning these candles and they don't make any noise at all. I mean, you you can make noise loading them because they're in these big metal you know ovens, but generally they're they're really dangerous. I and mean, when, when we were on an underway one time, we were doing what we called uh, hot change outs, which is where you take the old candle out while it's still burning and they, i mean these things are like 400 degrees i think we would give it about 10 minutes to cool off and then we'd pull it out with oven mitts and then we would load a cold one in there and we'd light it again and that was how we were producing auction that underway and it was so hot that the oven and all of the metal had expanded and we couldn't get the lid back on and so we were like kicking it and pushing it with our boots and me and the guy that were on watch actually melted the bottom of our boots off on that oven because those oxygen candles burned so hot and uh, it's interesting to hear that story about 
this particularly because I had lit so many of them and they didn't tell us it was ever like an explosion hazard. I never knew anything about that. But then you said, you know, well, they stored it wrong. They put oil in it. Well, that makes a whole lot of sense. You know, if you just pour a bunch of oil in something that's, you know, hundreds of degrees, more than likely it's not going to turn out very well. And it's super important this stuff gets stored correctly. Yeah, and to, to me, this is nothing to do with the crew itself. The crew knew nothing about that, how they'd been stored. So um, the tragedy was that leading weapons engineer Paul McKern and weapons engineer Anthony Huntrod lost their lives because of that poor storage. They followed every procedure as they should have done, and they could never have known that was going to happen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was it was a, it was a very tragic day, a very tragic day, obviously, and, and it showed, but it also showed once again how how amazing submariners can be in dealing with really really tough situations and recovering from them yeah definitely you know we every every submarine comes with its own personality and we had a, a few problems while we were there but the 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 one that that was really funny was and it never happened so what happened was we had a guy who was not qualified he went back aft and saw what he thought was a steam line rupture and decided to call it away and uh it was never even it was never even a leak it, 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 he was seeing uh some kind of condensation get on a steam line and just kind of steam off you know he decided to call it away as a steam line rupture and that that was one of the one of the times I actually thought I was going to die yeah. because, you know, if somebody calls away a steam line rupture, that's about as bad as it gets, especially if it's, you know, like a full blown out pipe. And it's it's not a very good way to go. You don't want to get cooked like a crab. You know, I'd, I'd much rather die in an explosion. I don't really want to die a slow death like a crab. But, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that story. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, do you know, it's amazing. Submarines are the most amazing things. First line of defense of any nation and the last line of defense when you think about the ballistic missile submarines. The most complex platform that any military has ever made. Um, and it operates in a, a void less explored than space. And and it is. It's hugely, it's, it's a huge risk we take on every day. Even if, even if you're not taking on the enemy, actually just the sea itself can be tough enough to deal with. Um, and yet submariners willingly do this because they love, in general, love what they do and the difference that they make and they love the camaraderie. Um, and you become a bit, you, a complacent's the wrong word, but you become a bit neutralized to the, the risk of the environment that you work in. But it, it's so rewarding. Yeah, definitely. It uh, it's it's something I think about a lot. You know, uh, I wear my dolphins proudly, and I think everybody else does too. It's one of the it's one of the one warfare pins you still get. You know, along with like the seals and some of the other ones that people you know they're still really proud of what they wear. And every time I have a tough day, I I think about all the crap I had to go through on that thing and just how rough it was and how much time we were underway and how I never saw my friends or my family. And it definitely set the bar for my life. And thank God I don't have to ever reach that bar again. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so talking about uh, setting high bars, uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the parachute program. Sure. So you guys have a, and, and we do too, but you guys have like an actually nice publicized one called the parachute program where it's a, a, a command course where you teach captains how to command and leadership. So can you tell me a little bit more about what that entails? Because I've heard stuff about you guys walking the gangplank and stuff like that. Like, is, can you give me a little bit of clarity on what all that is? <laughs> Okay, so um, so well, the first bit is you have to get selected for it. So it's it's and it's quite a tough selection process, really. Um, but if I if I put it in perspective, so twenty seventeen was the uh, centenary of the parachute course. So in a hundred years, I think the, the figures, and I might be slightly out on this, but the figures were just over a thousand people had taken the course, um, but just under four hundred passed it over 100 years wow and then um just just over 40 people had taught the course when you look at it in those figures it is it is it's an incredibly tough course but the way the course is now structured so it's a, it's a six-month course there's and, and you can divide it into three phases the first phase is all simulators so before you get to take the submarine to sea for four weeks. You spend a lot of time in simulators. You spend a lot of time learning from others. So um, when I was running the course, lots of captains would come in and discuss their challenges in a completely open and safe environment and be completely open about things when they've gone wrong so that the next generation can learn from them before they hopefully don't do it. But if they do do it, at least they, they understand what's happening there. And then, uh, and lots of visits as well. So, so you need to understand the strategy 
uh, within which you operate. So it's about visiting government, it's about visiting headquarters, it's about visiting different organisations that might have an impact, like GCHQ, like well, you, you, you might go over to America and meet, meet people out there as well. And then you go into the simulators, and the simulators spend a lot of time dealing with visual safety. Um, so about four weeks of visual safety training. And then the rest is all tactics. So you'll go through every single potential scenario whilst living like you're um, in a mission. So so you're doing all your mission planning as well. And each time you come into the simulator, there'll be different things to deal with. And then that culminates uh, in going to sea for four weeks. So my, my view when I was a teacher was all of that was training. All of that was training. You should make as many mistakes as you possibly can now. Um, and I will tell you when you're being assessed. So I want you to learn all the time. And so they would they would do all of that. And then as soon as we go to see, uh, you got a week and that's still training. And then we're into assessment. And it's basically three weeks of warfare. It's tough stuff, uh, loads of challenges, very little sleep. So you're in the most stressed situations you can be. And, and the thing for me was to, you could challenge people um, and I do it by asking questions and I would ask questions and I would ask a counter cup question and maybe sow some doubts in the mind of the captain who's made a decision. And, and, and the big thing for me was, is he going to stick by his decision or can he decide? Can he lead his team? Do the team want to follow him? You get more from watching the team supporting him than you do from watching the, the captain himself. Um, and you can see whether the team's going to follow him or not and, and what they're going to do and how they treat their people. So when you're under that much stress and it's your career, uh, at stake it can have adverse reactions with people and um, in that steel tube there's nowhere to hide and so it becomes completely apparent as to what type of character you are and, and as to whether you should have the privilege of leading 130 people on autonomous missions with nobody there to check you so um so so that for me was was how how you reach the assessment criteria and i had some objective assessment criteria as to whether they whether they were capable or not capable. And if you didn't pass, you didn't pass. That was your time, um, your, your, your opportunity to be a submarine captain uh, and you're not going to get another one. And you'd go back to the surface fleet or into intelligence or another part of the Navy in order to try again. And many people who failed the parachute course have gone on to be, gone on to be surface ship captains, not because that's any less difficult, but because it's slightly different. And they've done it successfully. So, um, so that's the course, and it's been going. It's it's evolved. I, I'm glad to say it's evolved for, for and it's fit for the 21st century. Um, I, I, I like the fact that the guy who's just been teacher um, was my second in command when I was um, when I was in HMS Turbulent. That's brilliant news. And um, and also the guy who's taking over from him was one of my students when I taught Perisher. So, um, which is also fantastic. So yeah, it's a very rewarding job. Uh, very tiring, but it's really great to enable the next generation of captains. Yeah, it's definitely nice to train your relief, definitely. Um, so you were saying that uh, you had a lot of objective criteria that you you, you trained off of. Like, how, how much would you say is objective uh, compared to just subjective as who, who is the actual instructor? You know, everybody instructs differently. Yeah, that's true. So when I became teacher, I was very wary that I could basically end up going, OK, well, I led well when I was a captain. And therefore, you can end up with a bit of unconscious bias and saying, well, if they're like me, then that's it. That's good. And if they're not like me, then maybe that's not as good as it could be. That's not a great place to in instruct the parish, of course, from. So I did a whole load of work with police Scotland, so the Scottish police, effectively. So what the first thing I did was go off and do one of their leadership courses. So I went off to go and do the uh, Silver Commanders course. So to manage high potential incidents, and I also did part of the negotiators course. And the reason I did that was to take myself out of my comfort zone, because being a submarine captain and then going off to teach submarine captains is still your comfort zone. So I needed to be taken out of my comfort zone and I needed some objective feedback as to what they thought of my leadership style and how would that do to translating. And what I quickly realised was that they could help me with building a um, an objective set of metrics that you could turn around and go, okay, this is what good looks like, this is what average looks like, this is what poor looks like. And then you'd measure it across that. And so so that's what I did. And and for me, I think in the 21st century, it, it, you could go back to last century, if somebody told you you'd fail a perisher but gave you no reason, you'd turn around and probably accept it and move on. Rightly, rightly, people want to know why. And so for me, I wanted to be absolutely prepared that I could justify every decision I made regarding somebody's career because it's, it's such a huge decision. 
And it's such a huge impact on that potential candidate that they have a right to have an objective rather than a subjective view of um, how effective or ineffective they've been. Right, definitely. So when you guys decide that uh, you want to discharge somebody from the program, how does that work? That can be pretty brutal, to be to be frank. I've seen it done where, and I didn't do it this way, but I've seen it done where basically the guy will be in the control room and suddenly... You know, the captain of the submarine comes in and says, I have the submarine. And then that guy gets taken, just literally taken out and then taken, not taken out, taken out of the uh, control room into the captain's uh, cabin discussion. And before you know it, the submarine's surfacing and there's a helicopter overhead taking the guy off. And that's just, that's how quick it can be. So, so for me, when I did it, I, I was a little bit trying to avoid the dramatic with regards to that but but it it is it is rapid but you just try and do it knowing that you've made the decision with somebody's career and effectively somebody's life so you need to be as empathetic as you possibly can and minimize the impact that goes with it so i would do it a little bit more subtly than than that where i could what's the uh, what's the what's the point of of getting them out of there so quickly that was what i never understood about it so the reason to get them out of there is because then they're not doing anything on the submarine and there's part of it is about the individual. So what you don't want is that you've been told you failed the course, but you've got to stay here for another week while the others carry on doing what they're doing. It doesn't work. And so what you can't have is, you know, they got, they got whatever it is, even if he's failed, then he's still got to eat, he's still got to sleep, he's still doing all the other stuff that goes with it. I think that would be detrimental to the guy. So you want to get him and eventually her, if they don't pass off as quickly as possible and remove them from that environment, go and give them time to pause and reflect and then give them the support to work out where their Navy career progresses after that. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's like, it's like firing somebody at work. You don't just like let them hang around and start carrying on discord through your, to wherever you're working. Right? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And also you want to, you know, you want to take care of your crew. So you gotta, you gotta, you know, take care of that guy. I bet that's rough. You know, you've, you've been training your whole life and then to have them tell you, sorry, you're just not really cut out for this. You know, it's, I can imagine that I probably wouldn't want to be there too much longer either. <laughs> no, no. Well, that's true. But I think, I think in the most course they know. So I don't think the ones that I failed, and I'm glad to say that I passed way more than I failed, but the ones that I failed knew. So when I told them in one case, there was a bit of relief because the pressure was now off. And in the other case, there was, there was some initial pushback and then accepting that actually, yeah, that was probably right. So yeah, it's, but it is, it's tough all for them. Man. Yeah. I bet it, it just, just going through that, that whole, that whole thing just seems, it just, I, I can't imagine what, what they'd have to go through. Yeah. That's, that's, that's probably about as tough as it gets. And that, that's at least, at least in my view, when I was on submarines, that, uh, that program, that type of program for the captains was probably the toughest that, uh, I had ever heard of. So yeah, I, I, I could imagine. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about real quick was, uh, was your book. So you have a book out. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. So while I was um, in command, you keep a classified diary anyway about kept an unclassified diary. And then and I, and I decided that I wanted to turn it into a book. Well, for two reasons. The first reason was because it was a great submarine and the world should be able to read about a great submarine. And the second bit was actually what an opportunity to share lessons in teamwork, leadership, servant leadership with everyone via the medium of a year in the life of HMS Turbulent. So, um, so yeah, it was tough. It was, it took, it took a long time to write, write it and get it right. And it's published, but I didn't take any money for it. So all the profit goes to veterans charities, which I think is right. My second book, however, I'm going to take some profit from that thing. Yeah, definitely. You should. Cause I was talking to all these guys who have written books, like you should definitely take something for what you do if you can. Yeah. But I, I'm a big proponent of, of donating a lot of my donations. When I did all the work with the submarine subreddit, I donated everything we made to, to help out different charities. Like we had a fundraiser for the San Juan when, when she went down. So yeah, that's, good, that's, that's honorable, man. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. That's something we probably need more of. So the, the AC story, the loss of your air conditioning is in that book. Are there any other cool stories that uh, we should check out or should know about before we go by it? There's a whole load in there. So, but I, th I think the big thing for me is I was really objective about simplifying what it's like to be a submarine captain and breaking it down to the base level. So, from everybody who's read the book, it's got great feedback from junior leaders. I know that they give it to um, submarine officers who are going on the submarine command course, which is which is really good, and tell them to read it. But equally, 
families can read it and just you know find out how their submariner lives and and survives while while they're while they're apart so it's, it, it covers a whole load of things well i really appreciate you man is there any other things that you're working on what's your second book going to be about can you talk about it a little bit it's a great book about a brother and sister who uh, both join the military. Uh, one joins the submarine service and one joins special forces. And there's, a, there's some great stuff in that. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's fictional, but as, as we all know, fiction is sometimes based around the truth. So, um, so it, it should be good. And, and that will come out uh, towards the end of this year, hopefully. Oh, man, that's going to be interesting. Those those are generally the most popular and the most interesting because you can uh, kind of hide in the details. You know what I mean? So uh... Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you for coming on. Real pleasure. I don't have anything else. And uh, if you guys, uh, please uh, subscribe, follow us on Twitter. What is your uh, Twitter handle? At Ryan Ramsey 14, right? That's it. That's correct. Yeah, please feel free to follow. Yeah, definitely. Make sure you go buy his book. Yeah. Thank you for everything. Cheers. Thanks very much. Well, thank you guys again. Yeah, have a good day. Tech Ops is owned and operated by hosts Eric M. and Greg R., along with producer Kyle Smith. Copyright 2019. Music by Kevin McLeod, Twisted, Creative Commons 3.0.